And last Sunday, we saw how the Holy Spirit led Paul and Silas, along with those believers who traveled with them, to Macedonia. Macedonia, I believe, is in Greece, in Europe, where they're able to start up a new church in Philippi. Now, two groups of uh, people heard and accepted the gospel there in Philippi. I want to see if we remember who they were. What was the first group that they preached the gospel to? That's right, a group of uh, women. Um, a group of women were meeting together, most likely Jewish women were meeting together at the river because there, was not, there weren't e e enough Jews in Philippi to have a synagogue, so they needed a place to worship, they needed a place to come together and pray, and so they just met at the river and prayed. And uh, Paul found out about them, and so he went to them and he preached the gospel to them, and they accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the second group consisted of prisoners. And the prison guard who heard Paul and Silas pray, who heard them sing hymns to the glory of God, and then they witnessed something great. They witnessed a great earthquake that was strong enough to open the doors of the prison where Paul and Silas were imprisoned. And I mentioned in the men's prayer breakfast on Saturday morning that uh, I've also experienced a pretty large earthquake in my time. Um, I, I was uh, traveling to Ontario, and uh, when the plane set, I was in the airport, and there was a six-point-something magnitude earthquake. And it was incredible. You could see the glass of, of the windows in the airport sway back and forth. It almost, to me, it looked like they were going at least a foot in either direction. It felt like a plane crashed into the airport. It was amazing. It was an experience I'll never forget. And yet it wasn't strong enough to to throw open prison doors. So I can only imagine the earthquake that they experienced, that manifestation of God's power that they experienced in Philippi. Now, if it should be noted that uh, God opened those prison doors not to release Paul and Silas, but to display his power to the jailer and the other prisoners. We know this because if we continue reading in verses uh, 35 to 36, we see that Paul and Silas were still prisoners after this. God's word tells us, And when it was day, the magistrates, or the city officials, sent the officers, saying, Let those men go. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. So even though the prison doors were open, Paul and Silas stayed there. They knew that they weren't released yet by the officials, and so they stayed there in the prison. And the next morning, they were let go. However, Paul refused to leave the prison without an apology from the magistrates who wrongfully imprisoned them and who had them beaten. And it wasn't because Paul was trying to make a stink about everything. Yes, Paul was a, a Roman. He told them that he was a Roman. And, and he knew that Romans had spe specific and special rights from the government. They weren't allowed to be uh, persecuted or punished without a fair trial and so forth. And this greatly um, worried the magistrates for having done something illegal. But that wasn't the reason why, why Paul refused to go without an apology. He wanted to make sure that this new church that he helped start in Philippi would be protected against any future kind of persecution as well. He wanted to make sure that they would not be targeted by the officials. And so he did make a bit of a stink about this. And he did it uh, for the sake of the new church in Philippi. After being freed, we're told in Scripture that Paul and Silas still visited Lydia and then also this new congregation in Philippi, and then they continued their travels to two no new locations that we read already, Thessalonica and Berea. And I've entitled this message this morning, More Fair-Minded, or maybe we could say Being More Fair-Minded. And these words come straight from Scripture, it comes from Acts chapter 17, verse 11, where Luke the author of the book of Acts describes the Jews in Berea to be more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. And to understand what Luke meant here, we want to do a comparison this morning between the Jews in both locations, in Berea and Thessalonica, and then compare each description to our own lives, to ourselves, to see which group better reflects our attitude toward God and our attitude toward His Word. So again, in Acts chapter 17, verse 1, we see 
that they traveled first to Thessalonica. And so that's why we want to start our study this morning with the Thessalonians. Now we can assume that uh, Paul traveled first to um, Thessalonica because it was en route. They went uh, through two places, Amphipolis and also Apollonia. They didn't stop in these locations, most likely because there wasn't enough Jews in those locations or because they were just uh, too small of communities to stop. And so they went through these locations. They went to Thessalonica, which actually had a synagogue, meaning that they had more Jews in that location than uh, Philippi did. And if we continue reading, we get some more information in verses 2 to 4. It says there, Then Paul, and his, as his custom was, went into them. That means he went into their synagogue. And for three Sabbaths, three weeks in a row, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And this would have told them something. These were Jews. They knew what Christ meant. Christ meant Messiah. And they were waiting for their Messiah to come to establish a new Jewish kingdom here on earth. That's how they understood the scriptures. But Paul explained to them what the Christ actually did, that he came and died for our sins. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Jews, or the Greeks, I should say, and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. And one commentary notes, Thessalonica was one of the wealthiest and most influential cities of the Macedonia. This was the first city that Paul visited, where his teachings attracted a large group of socially prominent citizens. So this was something new for Paul. And how wonderful it must have been for Paul and Silas to finally have a larger group not only listen to them, but also join them. And we can assume that those words mean that they heard what they had to say and they accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ and were added by God to his church. They joined them. And however, we know that where God is working, there Satan works also. We heard that last week and the week before. And we'll see that again today. It's very clearly seen if we read verse 5. Verse 5a. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathered a mob together, set all the city in an uproar. Now some of the Jews, they did believe. We're told some of the Jews, they did accept Jesus as their Christ. That some of the Jews did recognize how one could be saved through Jesus' death and resurrection. Some of them did, but we're told the majority of them didn't. Most of the Jews, instead of accepting Jesus, became offended at their preaching. Now, what we've, from what we've read in the, these first five verses, what do we think? Why did they reject the preaching? Why were, there not pers- why were they not persuaded to become children of God? What was it? Was it because they didn't agree with the doctrine? Was it because they, they tested what Paul and Silas preached against Scripture? Or was it rooted in something else? Why didn't they receive the gospel? Why didn't they accept it? They became what? Envy. They became envious. That means they became jealous. They became jealous of Paul and Silas that all of these people joined them. A large amount of the devout Greeks joined them. And the leading women, most likely Jewish women, joined them. Perhaps even their wives joined them. But most of the Jewish men didn't. They were jealous. They were envious. Of them. These uh, devout Greeks, Adam Clark writes that they were most likely proselyte Jews. That means they were Gentiles who had accepted Judaism, but were most likely not yet circumcised. That's who these devout Greeks were. Another author writes, the Jewish leaders didn't try to refuse the theology of Paul and Silas, but they were jealous of the popularity that these preachers had. Their motives for causing their riot was rooted in personal jealousy not doctrinal purity. And there are so many people today that use the same tactic that the Jews back then used. What do I mean? Instead of listening to the truth and examining their own lives in relation to that truth, so many today, they'd rather just stop their ears, plug their ears, 
raise their voices as loud as they can in order to distract themselves and others, in order to drown themselves out or drown the truth out, and so that God cannot speak to their hearts. That's what they prefer. We see this kind of behavior in our political system today, where the one side refuses to consider the reasoning or the arguments of the other side, and instead they just stop their ears and start to scream and sometimes even encourage violence. This is nothing new. The kind of attitudes and behavior that we see in our politics today is nothing new. We see it already back then. It's an old tactic. And I'm reminded of the martyr Stephen. The Jews who stoned Stephen. When he preached, when Stephen preached to his accusers about their need for Christ, what did they do? Listen. They cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at Stephen with one accord, and they cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. They didn't want to listen. They stopped their ears. They screamed. They wanted to drown out the truth that Stephen preached. So many do that today, loved ones. And do you know something? Who stood among these accusers? Paul. Back then, they called him Saul, the Pharisee. He was there. The accusers, those who stoned Stephen, they laid their clothes, their their jackets, we could say, at Saul's feet. And he was to to watch them, make sure they didn't disappear. He consented to Stephen's death. And now Saul was on the other hand of this behavior. Now Saul was being treated the same way that he had treated the Christians. Because of jealousy. Their actions, their behavior is because of jealousy. And we know that it's because of jealousy because of what we read next in verses 5 to 7 in their behavior and what they do. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down, and I'd say praise the Lord for doing so, turned the world upside down, have come here too. Jason harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, and there is, loved ones, Jesus Christ. The Jews knew that they had nothing of which they could accuse the Christians, accuse Paul and Silas of before the authorities, and so they did as the Jews in Jerusalem had done with Jesus. They made up some bogus claims, some bogus charges of treason against these Christians. And if we look into the historical context of that time, we get a better understanding of why they accused them of these things. Historians explain, in the year 49 AD, that's one year prior to Paul being in Thessalonica. That was just a year earlier. In the year 49 AD, the Roman Emperor Claudius expelled all the Jews from Rome due to the riots that were ignited by a group of zealous Jews. These insurrectionists were advocating revolution against Rome and were opposing the installation of a new king. And so Paul's accusers were trying to paint him as one of these revolutionaries who was bringing sedition to Thessalonica. And in two weeks from now, we'll get back to this topic in our study of the church in Corinth. But this is what they did. Since they could find no charge against them, they made something up. And they couldn't find Paul. They couldn't find Saul or Paul, and they couldn't find Silas, and so they dragged Jason before the authorities. What do we know about Jason? That's all we really know about him. So he most likely had them staying at his house. That's all we know about Jason. It was Jason then, because he harbored them, that took the heat and paid for the bond for Paul and Silas. And I like what one author had to say about Jason, because we, we know so little about him, I thought I'd read this. It says, Jason is just one of the many unsung heroes who faithfully played their part to help spread the good news. Because of Jason's courage, Paul and Silas were able to minister more effectively And then the author says, you may not receive much attention. In fact, you may receive only grief for your service for Christ, but God wants to use you 
Lives will be changed because of your courage and your faithfulness. God blesses the unsung heroes. We read nothing else about Jason and that he was willing to take the heat for Paul and Silas and that he was willing to distract a violent mob so that Paul and Silas could travel and continue their journeys. And they did. Paul and Silas then traveled 50 miles southwest by night, 50 miles, to a place called Berea. And verse 10 says that when they got there, they did the same thing as they did in Thessalonica. The first thing they did was head for the synagogue and preach about Jesus. I love it. These are the people that most likely would have had them stoned again, convicted again. But they knew that Jesus told them to start with the Jews and go from there. So they did as they were told. They went to the synagogues. And in verse 11, Luke describes the Bereans. He describes the Berean Jews by comparing them to the Jews in Thessalonica. And he says these, or Thessalonica, he says these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. Now some translations say that they were more noble than those in Thessalonica. And if we continue reading verse 11, we see Luke explain himself as to what he meant by these words. He says, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness and that they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So here are two very important points for us as children of God, two things that we can learn from, from the Bereans, and we want to briefly look at each. First, they received the word with all readiness. What do you think? What does that mean? They were eager to learn. They were waiting for more. In order to learn something, what, would you, what do we first have to do? We have to listen. Amen. We have to listen. We're ready to listen. Ready to listen. They were ready to learn. It is so important that we are ready to listen. How is it with us, loved ones? Are we like them? We need to be fair-minded to preachers of the gospel. We, we need to come in God's house. And, and when we do so, we need to be willing to listen. We need to come with the intent to listen to what's preached. Do we do that? Or do we come thinking that we already know everything? Know that we the, Think that we know everything and that... Uh, We don't need to listen anymore. We already know what the pastor is going to say. We've heard this sermon so many times. I know I'm so much older than the pastor. I've heard so many other pastors preach. I know it all already. With that kind of attitude, can we learn something new with that kind of attitude, loved ones? No. You know, sometimes, even if we know a message already, even if we know what the pastor is going to say, sometimes we need to be reminded of of certain things. Now, Jesus addressed the same topic numerous times in his preaching, obviously because the people still needed to learn it, right? Do we come ready to learn, ready to listen, or do we already know everything? What happens if we come with the attitude that we already know everything? What's going to happen to us? Eventually, maybe, yes, if we have that attitude. Are we going to be engaged while we listen? We're going to get tired. We're going to get sleepy. We're going to rest our eyes a bit. Might fall asleep. Now, sometimes I, it's very understandable when, when people are, are very tired. They've had a very busy work week. And some people work on Saturdays. It's, I understand that. But if we come every Sunday, Sunday after Sunday, and we fall asleep in the pews, I don't know if you're ready to learn and ready to listen. Another thing that we can learn from the Bereans is to test what we hear from the pulpit with what Scripture says. With our technology today, we have access to every kind of preaching in existence. And and I don't want to blow your mind this morning, but not everything that's preached behind a pulpit is true. Do you believe that? We need to test what's preached. We need to be vigilant 
and test what's preached. We have the internet today, YouTube, where every church streams every message and everybody has access to every message. Now, I'm not saying what other preachers, uh, preachers preach is wrong. No, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying when we listen to somebody else preach, when we listen to anybody preach, we need to test what is preached to with what scripture says like the Bereans did. We need to be vigilant and test what we hear. After departing from Berea, Paul stopped in Athens and then in Corinth. He stopped in Athens and then Corinth. We're going to listen or learn about that next week and the week after. But while he was in Corinth, he wrote a letter, and scholars believe that he wrote the first letter to the Thessalonians. And then later on, maybe even his second letter to the Thessalonians from Corinth. And in that letter, he tells the Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 22, let me just find that here for us so we can follow along. Here you go. Verse Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22, he says to them, Test all things, hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. In other words, he's telling the Bereans to be more fair-minded, like, or the Thessalonians to be fair-minded like the Bereans. To be like the Bereans. And what I find wonderful about Paul and Silas is they were okay with their preaching being tested with Scripture because they knew that scripture would only further validate their words. They knew that if they would test what they preached, it would only draw those people further or closer to Christ. And that's exactly what scripture tells us, that after they eagerly listened, and after they tested everything they heard, that first word in verse 12 is therefore. Because they did those things, they were drawn even closer to Christ. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. So praise the Lord, a new church had been founded, very different than in Thessalonica. There was no persecution in Berea. The people listened, and they tested what they heard, and then they accepted the gospel. And a great many of them did. So within a relatively short period of time, God was able to plant two new churches, two new congregations, through the service of Paul and Silas and the other believers with them in Thessalonica and in Berea. The Thessalonian church consisted predominantly of Greeks because the Jews in the area, they closed off their hearts to God's word. They closed off their hearts to Paul and Silas and they became jealous of them instead. They, they persecuted the Christians. They persecuted Jason. And eventually they even, God's word tells us, we didn't read that or we did, I think, in verse 13, that they went down to Berea afterwards. And, and they wanted to persecute the Christians there too. Because of the jealousy in their hearts. They were so different than the Bereans. The Berean Jews, loved ones, were more fair-minded. They received the word with readiness, and they tested what they heard with Scripture. And how often did they do this? What does the Bible say? They tested it daily. They listened daily and they tested it daily. That was their, their eagerness to learn and their, their love for what they were hearing. It was wonderful. They did this daily. And they discovered that everything preached to them was deeply rooted in Scripture. And so they accepted it. And so they applied it to their lives. They gave their hearts to Jesus and a new church was planted. Loved ones, do we see ourselves in either one of these groups this morning? Are we open to the gospel and its life-changing power? Do we test the things we hear preached? Do we test the things we see online? Do we test the things that we read about in all of these various books that we can get these days? Do we test them to see if they're true? And when we confirm that it's true, do we accept what we learn 
and apply it to our lives? Or are there things in our hearts that are preventing us from listening and accepting the gospel? Have we closed off our hearts to God's word and become offended? Do we become offended, loved ones, when we hear things preached that hit just a little bit too close to home? You know what? When I get offended, or better said, when I hear something preached that bogs, that bugs me and bothers me, I think about that a lot. How could that pastor say that? I mean, how could he say something like that? And it, and it goes and it goes and it goes. You know what? Usually, the things that bother me most are the things that God still wants to change in my life. And then we test it with Scripture. Lord, you know how bothered I am by this thought. Is it true? Is this how you see me? And when it is, then God desires that we humbly bring it to him and thank him for showing us this thing that at first bothered us, but then later made us more like Jesus Christ. Are there things that bother you about the preaching that you hear? Bring those things to the Lord. Bring those things and test those things with what Scripture says. And if it's true, then let God change your heart. Let God transform that part of you that he still wants to transform. Don't be like the Thessalonians, who instead of accepting the word, persecuted the church. Loved ones, are we like the Thessalonians, adversaries of the gospel, or are we like the fair-minded Bereans, open to the truth, ready to learn, testing what we hear with God's word? It is my hope and prayer that God make us like the Bereans. Amen.